Welcome everyone. You are joining the third Building Health Equity webinar series. Today's um, topic is, or today's um, program is, Health Equity Practice Among Today's Youth. I have some terrific speakers with me today. Um, I am Trisha Kitzman. I am with, I'm the program coordinator um, for the Institute of Public Health Practice um, with the University of Iowa College of Public Health. A um, couple of housekeeping things I want to go through before we get started. Um, this session is a Zoom meeting format. Um, you can stay muted with the option um, with your camera off or on. Um, note the session is also being recorded for later viewing. Um, we do ask that if you um, have background noise in that to remain muted while, um, if, unless you are either unmuted or raise your hand to speak. Um, you can find the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can message Kathleen and Natalie. They are my, um, I guess, co-workers or people in crime helping um, facilitate the meeting today to keep me on track and to be able to watch the, for the Q&A and the chat box. So feel free to use either or that you're more comfortable with. Um, our speakers have also indicated that feel free to raise your hand, ask questions right away throughout the um, presentations. Um, you do not need to wait till the end to ask your questions. We really want this to be a dialogue and conversation between all of us. Um, if hands are raised, we will temporarily take you off mute so you can um, ask your question or engage in a conversation. Again, we'll try, depending on time allowing, we'll try to get to everyone so you have an opportunity to ask your question. But again, feel free to put things in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, I encourage you to also introduce yourself in the chat box, um, who you are, where you are, and what do you do for a living? Um, that'll help the speakers and myself kind of know where you're coming from and what questions you may be having and to make sure we kind of cover some topics that may be of interest to you. So again, feel free in the chat box to um, provide some information about yourself and um, what things you may be looking forward to. With that, I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Talia and let you introduce yourself. And what I will ask of you is give us a little bit of your background. How did you get into your area of work and what do you do? All right, um, my name is Talia Meidlinger. My pronouns are she, her. I am currently the executive director at United Action for Youth in Iowa City. We're a youth serving org. Um, we like to call ourselves a one-stop shop for all things youth and families. If we can't do it here, we'll find someone who does it better or, or does it. Um, so, sorry, I just got distracted by the chat box. That's my uh, fatal flaw. Anyway, um, I came into social work by the way of an English uh, degree, uh, undergrad, bachelor's in English, and then I waited tables for a long time. And then I was like, this isn't going to do it anymore. Um, so I started out mentoring, uh, working at a mentoring program for young people who had an incarcerated parent. And then I got my master's in social work. Um, and just really think that it's important. I've always had a passion for working with youth and understanding youth and advocating for youth and helping their voices be lifted up. Um, I think young people are more powerful than we ever give them credit for. Um, and so I, I, I really like helping to find space for them to have voices and determine sort of their own trajectory in life and life outcomes. Um, happy, happy to be here today. All right. Fred, would you like to, same type of questions, give us a little bit about you, where you work, what you do, and where your passion came from. Yes, my name is Frederick Newell. I'm the executive director of Dream City, as well as a project director here at the Iowa City Community School District. Um, I got into this work um, through going to the University of Iowa. I graduated with my degree in social work. I started off as a nursing student um, struggled in that particular area and found a love for my professor, Sarah Sanders, who, who introduced me to social work. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. I had all the intentions to move back there once I graduated from the university. Um, I graduated in 2010 and I'm still here. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm kind of, this is home now. Um, and I got into this, the work that I'm doing because I'm just really passionate um, about youth and families, more, more so young people, um, especially young men of color. Um, 
And uh, I, hopefully that answered all that you just asked. <laughs> We're going to keep you forever, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think you're going to be um, I'm soon. I think, I think you've grounded yourself. So definitely doing some amazing work. So thank you both. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just start. Um, Fred, tell you, I'll just put out the question and let you guys kind of go after it. Um, and whoever wants to go first, I, I don't want to interrupt you. So I'll put the question out there, um, let you guys both answer it. And we'll kind of do that round robin, if that's okay. Again, I encourage all of our participants to go ahead. If you've got questions or want to raise your hand, um, please do so as we're going through this. Um, again, we want this to be a dialogue, not necessarily a, a lecture type format. So first question, um, what equity issues are you seeing in the communities you work with related to young people? What inequities? Is that what the question was? Oof. Correct. I don't know, Fred, you want to take that one first? <laughs> no, you can kick it to me. I don't care. No, I'll go. Um, I think oftentimes we see many inequities in so many different spaces and places. I think oftentimes we think that, um, I don't even think people understand what the word equity means versus equality. Um, and oftentimes our students or young people are just in need of different things. Um, so in the spaces where you're talking, whether you're talking school, whether you're talking community, um, whether you're talking doctor's offices, dentists, all of those different spaces, um, you see inequities in all of those different spaces. Um, and I oftentimes think that equity is tied to relationships, that when, once you start building relationships with individuals, you would understand exactly what they need and why they need it. Um, and I don't think there's enough people trying to get to know young people to truly figure out like what needs they currently have. And I'm going to throw it over to you, Talia. Yeah, I would absolutely. I'll, I'll start with where you ended, which is that we don't listen to young people. I mean, I think that we think that they are not responsible or how could you know, how could you need or want that autonomy over your life or your body or your health care? And in, in all of the years that I've been working with young people is they often know quicker, better and more about what they need to be better and to do better. Um, and that's just like, right, if we talk about young people in general, but then we break break us down into all of the various identities we all hold. And the number of young people of color, especially who have had incredibly inequitable treatment in, like Fred said, in doctor's offices, um, in public spaces, in parks, right? Like that impacts all young people, but especially young youth of color in our community, in our communities, right, struggle with inequitable treatment. We see it with our, um, you know, arrest records, our shoplifters diversion program we do here, here excuse me. <clears throat> We've had some terrible health outcomes for young people who have said, this hurts, this doesn't feel good. And, and doctors just said, nah, well, just, you know, come back in a month or so. And it led to really detrimental um, health outcomes for them. So I think just in general, thinking about how we give young people the power to, to have their voices heard and validated and respected and, and step away from our own need to be the adult who's in charge and be, be more the adult who's partnering with young people to get their needs met. Excellent. I'm gonna kind of do a follow-up question because Fred, you kind of said a lot of people don't know the difference between equity, inequity and equality. Um, describe that for us. Like tell us where, where you're kind of seeing the difference in those um, especially with young people. I mean, just I'll, I'll just give a quick example um, with equality. Every student need one step, maybe. Right. Um, so but if I'm taller than the person that's next to me, I don't need the step. I may need something else. Um, but because I'm giving every student the same thing or every youth the same thing, I think that is the right thing to do. Um, but oftentimes at, you can ask the three of us that that's on camera, you know, what we need right now. There we go right here. See, um, th th this is what equality allows for one to get the step, but still not get what they need. Um, but with equity, I'm willing to go above and beyond what may be necessary, because as we see with the person in the blue, they can already see the baseball game. But the, the person and the light blue, they couldn't see. But if I just if I'm just focused on everybody get the same thing, um, then I, I'll, I'll never realize that there are people that's getting the same thing, but they're not getting what they need. 
Um, and it's important that every person gets exactly what they need. And that's to me, I believe that is shown through building relationships. If you don't have relationships, you're not going to know what people need. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of where I was going with that. No, thank yeah. you. I love that. I mean, that's, yeah, like every person should get what they need and what every person needs is going to be different. And like, how, how do we get everybody to be able to watch the baseball game? Absolutely. Thank you. I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page when we were talking about this as we move forward. Um, looks like we have somebody with a hand up. Yeah, I just, just to echo, I, I remember being in high school, I, I think it was my junior year of high school and our um, equity director um, used that example. <laughs> and because I've always been the shortest one in the room, um, just to, like used me and another student and was like, okay, inherently Becca's shorter. So she's starting out lower and can't see the baseball game that's happening because inherently she's shorter so it would make no sense to give both of you the same step stool because becca will still be shorter than you and still might not be able to see the game and it was an organizer um who was lovely and did some community organizing work that i got to work with in um ferguson um and explained it as like if there are several um, houses or buildings next to each other that are on fire. Um, if two of them are on fire and the other six aren't, are you going to spray water on all of them? Are you going, because what's the point? No, you're only going to address, at that moment, you only need to address the houses that are burning. And so they're odd because they're automatic, they're burning, they're automatically at a disadvantage. Um, I guess from a structural, that's very literal, but I guess applies to the systems and structures that exist um, in every institution and system in our society as well. Great point, thank you for sharing. Okay, next question. What have your respective organizations done to create more equitable and healthier communities for young people? Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, like for UAY, like we always come from the place that like, we're here to work with youth. We're here to work for youth. We're here to hear their voices and figure out how to lift them up so that our world and community looks like what it is that they need. Um, an actual uh, tangible example that we are currently working on right now is um, we have a young parent program who serves young people who are pregnant and or parenting. Um, and we have um, some folks who have graduated from the program but wanted to still be involved. And so we started a young parent advisory committee. And one of the things they said they wanted they talked about was the way that they were treated in doctor's offices. One, they're all young. And two, a majority of them are, are young women or young men of color. And they were talking about how they were treated in a doctor's office, the kinds of questions they were asked. Like we had, we had um, a client who sat down in the doctor's offices. It was her second baby. And the first question that the doctor asked her, she's a person of color was, uh, do your kids have the same dad? Right. Like what? That's a really offensive question to ask. You wouldn't ask me that question. Right. And so we were like, well, how, how do we get this off the ground? What are we doing? And so we reached out to the university and we're actually working on gathering um, through storytelling some examples of young people, people of color, LGBTQ folks, anyone who has a marginalized identity who's willing to share their story and be interviewed to show that to uh, pediatricians in training so that they can get real life examples of how medical uh, treatment sort of drove young people outside of, of having a medical home or trusting the medical community. Um, we know that, you know, uh, there's a lot of health inequities in, in the medical system. And so that feels like sort of a cool thing that we're going to be working on is gathering those stories to educate doctors and training about how detrimental the way that young people are treated, right? How that, how detrimental that is to their ability to access um, medical care in their futures. Wonderful. So I was getting ready to answer, but there is a fire alarm going off in our building. So I need to step away real quick just to make sure. So, no, no, you're you're absolutely fine. I'll be right back. <laughs> Good luck, Fred. We'll come back to you. No worries. <laughs> well, there's something you don't always plan for, right? Yeah, right. Yep. 
So tell us a little bit more. So when we have situations like that and, you know, this, the youth are sharing with you the concerns that have come up, what, how can we continue to encourage or open those pathways? So, so the youth feel comfortable sharing with you or other organizations, or even being able to advocate for themselves when they're at those appointments. Um, what sort of tools would you recommend organizations to look at to be able to empower those youth to feel confident? I mean, I know there's the education piece, obviously, with the organization, mm-hmm. and that's wonderful. But what else can we do for our youth to make sure that they feel comfortable doing that? Yeah, I mean, like anything we learn, we learn by watching and doing with other people, right? How do you open, how do you open a bank account? How do you pay a bill? How do you know? So I think it's, it's one, making sure that your staff are up, up to snuff and understand positive youth development strategies, youth engagement, how to connect with youth, how to talk to them. Validation is so important, right? Like if a, if a young person says I had a terrible experience with the doctor, they didn't listen to this pain I was having. And you're like, oh, you probably just misunderstood what they were saying, right? Right away. That young person now knows you're another adult that I can't trust mm-hmm. versus, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's so frustrating that they didn't listen to you. What should we do about it? Right. And to problem solve and then say, let's schedule a, a follow-up together and, and let's talk about, let's coach this conversation together. Let's rehearse it together so that then you can see how that works in action, right? Empowering people to, to learn to use their voices. I mean, we live in a society where we just want kids to fall in line and listen to authority and obey and be obedient and all these things that really um, go against what we want for young people, which is to say, this doesn't feel good or I don't like this, right? This You don't have my consent to do this. Um, and so I think really having those intentional conversations about okay, what's our best strategy to help advocate for you to have a different or better experience or to let somebody know what just happened to you? Um, And to expect a young person to do that alone? No way, no way, right? Then they'll just avoid. I don't want to have that conversation. I just won't do it. But I think to really sit down, validate the experiences, talk through how do we, how would you like to solve this problem? How can we work together, rehearse it, and then follow through with the plan Um, gives people, young people, all of the strength and ability to see, wow, I really can advocate for change for myself. Awesome. All right, Fred, I'm assuming the building's not on fire since you're back. It's not, it's not. (laughs) Good. I'll turn it over to you. So what was the question again? No worries. Um, um, What have your respective organizations done to create more equitable, healthier communities for young people? Uh, I would just add to what Talia was saying. Um, Our organization is all about young people's voice and choice. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is um, being listeners, um, hearing w- what is the need um, and on top of what is the need, who are what can we provide versus what can our partners provide? Um, so I believe like I'm I'm not shocked to be doing this with Talia, but our organizations have even been more intentional about what does this work look like for all of us? Um, where can we collab? Where where can we make sure the things that we're offering the kids at where I'm at, that they're getting that from UAY or vice versa? Um, so I, I think our organizations are really taking time to really figure out the voice and the needs of young folks. Um, and then we are looking to partner with all the individuals that's even on here. If you have something that you offer to young people, um, like we want to bring you in. We want to have conversations with you. We want you to be able to come listen to our youth about their experiences so that it's not coming from an adult. Um, and our organizations, we've been really intentional lately about not speaking for our young people um, and always inviting them to come be a part of the the, the conversation and the meetings, um, because mo- most times we're talking about them. But I mean, they can talk for themselves. Um, and as Tali have said, they they are experts on themselves and the things that they need. Um, so we're really intentional about giving them the space and place to be able to be themselves um, and really intentional about helping them to grow their relationships with the people within this community. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, comments, or things you also want to share, feel free to either raise your hand, put um, any comments in the chat, and or the um, question and answer box. I will move on to the next question. Um, how do you think the health departments, local public health agencies, other nonprofit organizations that work with young folks can help ensure 
and equitable environment for youth? What are some of the steps that they should ensure they're taking? What are some of the programs or things you would recommend for them to implement to ensure that they're providing the safe environment for all the youth? I, I could take that first. Um, one, I think it would just be good for those in those um, spaces to get out of that space to go where where young people are. Um, because again, oftentimes, even when my own kids come into, um, whether it's the doctor, the dentist, they don't see people that look like them. They don't, they don't, they don't see themselves in the pictures. Um, so if those individuals providing those services can come to spaces where those young people feel comfortable, um, I think that would be a great start. Um, as well as being more intentional in the hiring practices of organizations who serve um, people of color um, and those positions, like be intentional of bringing some of us into those spaces to work um, because that called, I mean, that helps with the anxiety. I think about black men, um, we do um, this thing called the Father's Network. Um, and most of our doctors, I mean, most of our, our fathers don't go, they don't have doctors. Um, and a lot of that is around, they don't, they're not comfortable or they don't feel like they're going to go speak to somebody that understands what they're going through and things of that nature. Um, so I just think we have to be more intentional and, uh, maybe just coming into our space to build those type of relationships, um, or just be inviting to us when we do come in those spaces so that the stories that are being told will make other people comfortable. Um, because it's not always easy to walk into a doctor's office. It's not easy to go into getting counseling and therapy and those type of things. Um, and in my community, you know, some of those things are just foreign for reasons that they should not be foreign. Um, so just more educational opportunities to help people know what's available to them. Yeah. Um I, I think I have just two things to add on to that. One is is for young people in general, stay up to what's trending, right? Like setting a policy in, in place and then letting it sit forever or setting a practice in place and let it, that, that's just the way we do it forever. Um, young people are tuned in and their worlds are changing rapidly and we have to make an effort, a conscious effort to figure out how to adapt and connect with them. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh yeah. Data, right? Like we all love data. If you have a grant or you work at public health or you do anything in the world, we kind of keep our, our eye on the numbers. Who's coming in, who's going out, who's having what kind of experience, what are the demographics? Um, and it's, you know, if you have a hold in the demographics, like, uh, we're really not seeing this group of people come into these clinics or accessing these types of services really intentionally figure out why, right? Like, I think that we are like, well, we, we tried, we went through this list of these five things to try and engage that, that section of the community and they're not coming. So it must just be that this service isn't for them, right? It's an easy way to like, not do the hard work or have the hard conversations. And I think to really intentionally say, okay, who do we need to talk to who's a member of that particular community? How do we need to engage that community? Who are the people in that community who can be our spokespeople who can help us reach them, right? I think it all goes back to like Fred was saying, that relationship building. Like if you don't know me and I'm asking you, hey, why, why aren't people who share your identity coming into this clinic or, or accessing this service? They're like, well, I don't know you. Why would I tell you that, inf that information, right? Like the cornerstone of all change and all positive experiences, positive relationships so that you can have those hard conversations. And so I think, um, yeah, just, just making sure that we're, we're keeping an eye on who's coming in, who's not coming in and why aren't they coming in and what do we need to do to make this space more inviting for them? So, and as you talk about that and bringing, you know, bringing folks in and making sure we're reaching the, the populations that we serve, but also having the, the staff look like the community that they're serving, right? Like that's that's an important piece. Um, for those more smaller organizations that might not have funding to add on staff, that might not be able to um, maybe always go to the where the community is, what recommendations would you provide to them? I know we, we have so many amazing organizations in our community. However, several of them are very small and they don't have the capacity to maybe do as many outreach events as they would like, or they don't have the funding to provide, but they want to continue to reach youth. They want to be able to work with youth. What would be some recommendations you would provide them to ensure that they are getting the voices at the table that they, they need to have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I would say in, in terms of that, like we play this game around here called you might work at a nonprofit if dot, 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 like um, you have like a Play-Doh container propping up your fax machine. I don't know, things like that, um, because the budgets are a real challenge and there are representation things that are pretty easy to do. Like what kind of artwork do you have on your walls? What kind of magazines do you have on the table? Um, how are you greeting people? Are there things available in different languages? Um, and really like, what is your social media pushing out? What is your organization support? Um, who are you trying to reach? And, and really that relationship figuring out like, if, if it's of importance for you to serve a population that you are not connected to, you have to put in the work and build those relationships to serve that population. And so there are some things you can do on a budget to like make your space feel more inviting and trauma informed and, and representative of all the people you hope to serve. And the other piece is like, you got to figure out how to make it part of somebody's job to do some outreach or to build some of those relationships, because, you know, I, I can have a lemonade stand and offer free lemonade all I want, but if nobody knows who I am, no one's going to drink it. <laughs> right. So no, uh, Fred, do you have anything? Now you took all those things I was going to say, um, but just to add to that, I, I would add on that you just have to make time to get out. Um, like Dream City, I believe we are a very small nonprofit, um, but we sit on tons of committees that way that people can know what we do and we can learn tons about what others do. Um, I think sometimes as small nonprofits, it's good to just shut down for a day and actually get out there and learn um, so that people can learn what you do and for people to kind of learn what you do. Um, and I think representation, it just really matters, right? Um, for every nonprofit that wants to serve young people, but you're not, you just gotta go to where they at um, and let them know that you want to serve them. Um, and just to add on, and, and this is kind of not to this question, but I think it goes like, those practitioners, when you see young people in the store, do you speak? Um, when you see them at your neighborhood park, do you speak? Like those things would also open up opportunities to where um, dialogue can begin to happen when people are just friendly to each other. Uh, so even without a budget, it doesn't take much to say hello. It doesn't take much to ask how you're doing and to see where that leads you um, when you see young people within our community. Mm -hmm. yep. Wonderful. What, what are you hearing from the youth? Like, so you gave the example, Talia, about, you know, the, the physician's offices and, you know, being a young person of color pregnant and the inappropriate question, but what else have Fred, you and Talia heard from your youth of areas that have been concerning that, you know, there needs to be some work on? I think the most concerning thing that I hear that's a thing is young people feel like, they don't exist to others. So there's, there's this invisible thing that continually happen in all spaces. Um, and then when they are visible, um, it is because somebody is, they, they see them as something negative. So then there's some type of interaction. Um, and that just seemed like that is a common thing with a lot of the young people that um, I have the privilege to work with on a consistent basis. I mean, I would say right now, for sure, I'm I'm really worried about the well-being, mental health of all young people. Right. Um, I think this last school year, what we saw and I'm the most concerned about right now is is that we toss teachers and students back into school. Everything's normal. Right. We're past the pandemic. We just need to start functioning. And I think what that has done. Um, is created to, two sort of strings of mental health crisis for young people, right? Some young people internalize what's happening and become increasingly suicidal or anxious and depressed. And other, other youth feel increasingly externally, externalizing behaviors, right? Acting out, fighting, yelling, feeling disenfranchised, feeling like they don't belong. And by, I would say, just this is just anecdotally, but what we saw in our work with young people in the schools is young, young people who are people of color are acting out and angry and feeling like these spaces and places aren't for them and they're done and they're frustrated and they over and over and over are experiencing micro and macro aggressions and are mad about it and are letting us know. But instead of going, wow, I can really see how this has all been super traumatic for you. Let's figure out how to make this setting better. It's like, 
you have challenging behaviors. We're, we're going to reprimand you and kick you out or punish you. Right. And it really is. I, I think right now the biggest crisis I'm worried about is the way that we're continuing to beef up that school to prison pipeline because we're not addressing the mental health issues that are showing up for our young students of color and people of color in our communities. Anything else to add, Fred? Yeah, I mean, Talia just hit it on the head though, because I'm very concerned about the mental health of our students. Um, not even just our students, right? Like even practitioners who work with young people, like some of the things that get thrown at us or to us um, has literally been heartbreaking. Um, so I think that's another reason why from a community perspective, we have to do some work around community building um, so that all of us are playing a part and making sure that our young people are getting what they need emotionally. They're getting what they need physically, spiritually. Um, just all all around, like like I think Talia just like literally hit the 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 nail on the, the hammer on the nail that mental health crises are happening and they're not being addressed. Right, you can't expect a student to have been home for a year, um, isolated, right, um, and then come back into a space where sometimes you know I'm a little hesitant around groups of people and things of that nature to where I'm standoffish. Um, so those things need to be addressed because again, there's still fear with the pandemic It's not really over. Some people act as, as if it is, but it's not. Um, and if kids are not getting what they need emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, um, we're just creating more work for, um, the nonprofits that do work with young people. Um, and then that's, that's trauma on both the youth and staff of those who work with them. Yep. And mental health is such a challenging concern. It, it was it was a challenging and it was identified as a health issue across the state of Iowa um, for many years. For many local health departments, they do a community health needs assessment. And the last two cycles of the community health needs assessment that each nine, all 99 counties have to perform, mental health has been somewhere in their top three identified um, health issues impacting the communities. And that was pre-pandemic. So imagine um, what that's looking like now after, well, during and after, after the pandemic. Um, it's, it's challenging. There's not enough services out there. There's not enough funding. There's definitely not equitable um, services being provided depending on health insurance and being able to cover cost. And then we don't have enough practitioners, even if you have great insurance um, or even insurance to cover it. So there's so many issues surrounding that and the impacts it's having on our youth and our community is, is horrible. It's just, it's a horrible and it's a horrible cycle and working to fix that is it's going to be, it's going to take all of us. It's not going to take one particular organization. It's really going to take a community um, to continue to foster and help these young folks. Yeah. And I, and I think we're like, sometimes looking for old hat solutions, right? Like if we're going to solve this mental health crisis, we've, we were here pre pandemic, we have to figure out how to really weave all of these skills. Like I am a, I'm a social work and therapist by training, and I'm not the only one in the world who has these skills or should have these skills, right? How do we get all these skills into all of the hands of all of the adults who work with young people so that they're learning them as they go, because we're not going to grow 5,000 therapists overnight to provide one-on-one -on -one individual therapy to everyone. And so I think it's really thinking outside the box about how we, how we do that and being culturally sensitive to like, what are the barriers to accessing mental health care? And what do those communities who are it's stigmatized for, what do they need? What would they access so that we can, can have a much, cause it's a huge lift. Like we're not just going to like step out of this tomorrow and be like, Oh, that was tough. Um, yeah, sorry. That's my soapbox a little bit, but. Oh, absolutely. And I think until we've got so many barriers with trust and sharing and just being open to say that they have a mental health, they're going through a mental health crisis. I think saying that out loud is a whole nother scary thing in and of itself, let alone everything else that goes with yeah. that. And we have a lot of young people who wear, like I have anxiety or I have depression, like a badge of honor. Like it's a part of their identity. Like I'm comfortable talking about these things 
but they're surrounded by adults who are like, Ooh, that makes me uncomfy. I don't know how to talk to you about that. I don't know how to do that. Right. And so right. we're like all these adults who are in charge walking around blind with no skills to help kids through that stuff. So, yes. Well, on that, I, that seems to be, again, we're, it's sad for how much we don't let youth come to the table and share simply for the fact, because they're actually more equipped with feeling comfortable sharing things than, than most adults are right now. And I think it's because of the learning curve and the things that they've been through and the trauma that they've had due to the pandemic, especially with mental health and, um, LGBT concerns, all of that, um, they're vocal and now we just, we need to be okay in connecting them with the stuff that they need or the access and resources that they need and have them available. Yeah. And I don't want to jump too far ahead because maybe you're going to ask this question, but I mean, we haven't even, there's not even the tip of the iceberg about talking to kids about sex and their bodies and like the real facts of things like post pandemic. I don't know what you've read, but we're seeing a ton of uh, I'm, I, I am pro young people experiencing themselves and their bodies and doing whatever feels good and consensual to them. But there are things that we're hearing about that are like way above a ninth graders pay grade to be practicing. And I'm like, okay, so adults need to figure out how to hold space for those conversations because kids have access to the internet and are watching all sorts of stuff. Good for them. Like let's be sex positive and sex realistic too. Like we have to get ahead of things and, and talk to these young people because you know, that like, if you talk to them about it, they're more likely to do it. Suicide, sex, drugs. Nope. If you talk to them and they have the, fa- the facts and they have the, the facts to make an educated consensual decision for themselves. So. Um, have you, can you guys see the Q and a? Yeah. Rebecca, or would you be comfortable if I went ahead and opened your, um, your microphone. All right. Yeah. Oh, well, I just want to, first of all, what Talia just said. Um, so I'm, I did my MPH and I'm in between um, MPH and med school. So I'm um, doing some health educator stuff. Uh, so I've been doing for the last year and a half on um, sexual health education and substance use. Ed- well, no, substance use is more recent. That was for the last like six months. But um, with K through K through eight, sometimes K through twelve, and uh, families like caregivers. And what you just said is like what we've, I think, repeated a million and one times. And just to hear somebody else say that that's not us feels really validating. Um, but I guess, so I was just thinking about healthcare and access and um, like, even when there are available resources, utilizing the resources that are available. And something that I thought a lot about during my public health program and turned into my um, uh, dissertation was like they would continuously talk about outreach and being in the community and interventions to educate the community, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no um, reflection, like no introspection, I guess, into like, hey, maybe this is actually really valid. And maybe the answer isn't just education. Maybe the answer is yes, these fears are valid. And yes, they are rooted in very recent history. How do we address that? And also just something that's always on my mind, I guess, as a first gen kid is like, the really, really big differences in culture. And so having culturally competent is not even and it's like cultural adaptability and accuracy, I guess. And there's so little of that. And I just, I'm curious about your experiences with that and like linguistic access and not just being linguistically accurate and um, adapting interventions, but also culturally. And yeah, sorry, it's a lot. I just would love to know your experiences with that and how you've tackled some of that maybe. So it sounds like you're asking, how have we tackled representation and systems that might not serve 
the populations are worried about very well. Like, I guess the systemic, like, systems taking responsibility, like institutions of healthcare being like, yeah, this is valid. Like, this fear is not an irrational fear that's due to a lack of understanding and because, like, right. we don't get enough science. Like, no, it, it's valid and it's in the very, re it's in very recent history, take ownership. Right. And then my, I guess the other half of that then is like, making sure that even when there is access, are those services culturally adapted? Are they linguistically accurate and culturally sensitive? Like sort of two prong. I could say I could tell you. I mean, I think for Dream City, I think that's why we're very intentional about who we invite into our space, right? Everybody's not invited, right? If you're going to do harm to our youth, their families, um, we would do our absolute best to make sure that we're not exposing them to you. Um, I do hear what you're saying around, you know, how can a system do outreach to people that they have harmed, right? And I think even for that point, like systems have to acknowledge the harm or you never will really be able to, to create a, a space that makes others comfortable. Um, so I think that, you know, the way to find the balance between the two is you can't outreach until you have rebuilt what you messed up, right? Because again, when you go into the community and you are trying to recruit or whatever the case may be, the, the recruiter or the outreach person may have to answer to some of the things that systems have done to people. Um, so oftentimes I believe it is my job um, as an executive director, I'm sure it's Talia job and her staff job to make sure that we vet the people that we're going to expose to the people we work with. Mm -hmm. And really, it's really not my job to fix systems. Uh, so I do what I could control. Um, but if I know that there's a system that's going to cause harm, um, I just make sure that they I'm not exposing them to the people that I work with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All of that vetting people, making sure that we're not inviting um, other humans in who will cause harm to our kids in any way, shape or form, being really intentional about who we partner with and who we vocalize saying that, yeah, we're proud to partner with these people, right? Because young people know, families know, like if you, right? Um, and I got to say, human after my own heart talking about big systems, because man, like Fred said, I have control over my agency and how we show up and how we build policy and how we connect with community. Um, and I am a hopeless optimistic, but also, um, there's a lot of work to do. There's this documentary. If you haven't seen it on Netflix, you should called who we are America's history with racism. Um, it's beautifully done. It's very painful, but it talks about how all of our systems are built off of, you know, a constitution that was written to protect slavery, right? And so if we're talking about in-groups and out-groups, what that means is anybody who's an out-group is not represented by the systems that were formed off of these principles, right? And so in some ways it feels like with everything happening in the world, like lots of people who we care about are losing their rights and are feeling anxious about accessing systems and healthcare and trusting providers because there's fear that rights are going to be stripped away from, from us and others and people that we love. And so to be a part of a system and to just sort of have that, like, it's just the way it is. Why do you do it that way? We just do it that way. Cause we do it that way. Well, if it's causing harm, you have to agree within the system to be a disruptor, to push whatever small change you can, and at least be a voice of reason and safe place for anybody who comes to you with that information None of us have the power to overhaul all of the systems that make it difficult for humans to stay alive. And we can do what we can to at least provide positive experiences for those lives that we do touch. And so like Fred talked about, we've been so much about collaboration and mutual support of each other and each other's orgs and all of the youth and families and community members we serve because we can't do it alone. It's too tired to, it's tiring, it's exhausting to do it alone. Um, and I, and I think if our larger systems start to open their eyes and are willing to have those conversations with each other and with us, then we can push for some of that change. Um, and representation is just a very, a very small step in a very large, <laughs> complicated web of how do we fix this thing?
Thank you. Absolutely. And I will tell you, I love that you are so protective of the youth that you work with. Um, I was working with an organization before, and one of the things is more than just a background check and passing a background check to work with our youth. Um, it's so much bigger than that and yep. protecting them and getting them to organizations that continue to support them. So I appreciate what you both said on protecting the youth. It's it's key in getting them connected. You're not going to let organizations or individuals in that are going to do harm. And I think that's ultimately the number one thing that all of us need to pay attention to and ensure that we are, we're doing the right things for the youth. Um, I'm going to start, kick it off with our last question, but because I want to leave a little bit of time for folks to ask any questions that they have. So um, I'll kick off a question, but again, if um, those participating have any additional comments, questions that they would like to do, feel free to raise your hand, put it in the QA or in the chat. But the last question I'm going to ask is what advice would you give to health department staff or any other organization who's interested in beginning, beginning a youth health equity initiative? I would take that. I mean, make sure that the youth voice is included in that process um, and make sure that it's a, di a diverse group of students. Um, they can't all look alike. They can't all talk alike. Um, I think it's important that they diversify that particular group with youth voices. Um, and I would even say creating surveys to get even a greater number of young people speaking, because some youth may not be comfortable speaking to people they don't know. Um, but if you have like a quick survey, not a long one, because kids will look at it and be like, I'm not going to fill this long thing out. Um, but if you have something short and sweet, um, I think that will help to get some of the information that that's needed to be able to support them. Yeah. And make it for them, make it fun, make it appealing. If you have a, right, let's throw a party and have a DJ and pizza and we're going to talk about a thing. Um, and, and to not, not, I was just having a conversation. I have a six-year-old who's highly creative and has so many good ideas. And oftentimes my first thing is like, I don't think that's going to work. And then we try it and it works. And I'm like, wow, that really worked really well. And she's like, I told you, right. I think that we invalidate our young people a lot by saying, no, 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 you don't understand enough about the world to understand why that won't work. And so I think to gain the trust of young people is to hear from, like Fred said, a diverse uh, group of them and then say, that sounds kind of crazy, but yeah, let's do some TikTok videos or yes, I'll learn that dance. Or yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, let's launch that. Let's just pilot it and see how it goes. I think um, adults have good intentions with saying, we really want to hear from young people, but we fall short on the follow through and how we actually um, represent what they, they have asked us to do for them. So I think just making sure that you're doing justice, we are all doing justice. It's an ongoing struggle to give young people what they've told us they need. 100%. All right. Do any of our participants have any um, comments, additional questions, things that they would like to share? Please feel free to raise your hand. Again, put it in the Q&A or in the chat. While I'm giving everyone a few minutes to put any thoughts, final thoughts together, um, I do, I loved your example. I I hear all the time um, working with some youth that um, I'm involved with. And one thing that always makes me laugh is watching some of the other adults that are working. And we ask the question, we want to hear from them, <laughs> but then we actually don't implement anything that they, all the suggestions that they have, because we think we know more or we know better or whatever. And it's just, it's always amazing to me when we actually do. And again, there's multiple ways for teaching opportunities with that. Cause even if it fails, it's one of those, at least we tried, you know, and, and having, you know, putting that spin on it, that, um, that's just as important as it being successful as well. You know, you learn how to pivot and move and change to make something maybe work and it didn't work. And so how do we fix that? So I, I love that. And I, I think, again, it's something that us adults need to be politely reminded that <laughs> we don't always know best, right? We, we need to take that creativity that our young folks have. Yeah. 
I, I think we get um, hell bent on efficiency, right? Nope. We got to, we're going to get this idea. It's going to be perfect from the get go. And that's that all of that is just going to take less time. And like, that's just such a defeating that kills creativity, right? It kills a like, well, let's throw it at the wall and see if it's six or not. So. Right. Um, in the Q and a, there was a, thank you both so much for your insights and respect um, for youth voice. We can connect with you all collaborative and keep this conversation going. So I'm assuming you're like a yes. Absolutely. Um, I, w- I was going to make that plug. So our youth program uh, director is on. Um, her name is Shavana Norris. Um, so for anybody that is interested in connecting, um, please do so. I'm also going to plug uh, UAY, Dream City, Neighborhood Centers of Johnson County, um, Juvenile Court Services, Johnson County Social Services. Um, and Community Crisis Center. We are doing something on Monday nights, um, Mondays in the park at 4 p.m. And that's open to all community members. Um, so please come check us out, whether that's, I think our last Monday will be the first Monday in August. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a way to come connect with young people, to come connect with us. Um, we're looking at doing some back to school things together. And Tally and I, we've made the commitment. We're going to continue to work together together. Um, so if interested, please reach out to either of our organizations um, and we'll be sure that we can stay connected. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a fun time at the park trying to just engage youth differently. So come out and play and we'll feed you. Everybody gets fed who shows up for free. And, um, yeah, Susan, I, we, I, li- I love that. Like if it doesn't get me arrested or fired and it doesn't hurt anybody else, yeah, let's go for it. And that's the energy our youth need. Um, and for those who are participating, if you have, if you don't have your chat open, um, Fred and Talia have put their information in there as well. So um, please feel free to copy that as well. And I'm just double checking, making sure we've got the questions answered. Nothing else has come in. All right. Well, again, thank thank you all to the participants for spending an hour with us. I really appreciate it. Um, Fred, Talia, thank you for your insight. Um, I can't think of two more proactive, pro-youth, pro-equity um, folks to be talking about how we can improve the health and well-being of our youth in our communities. So thank you for sharing your expertise. I appreciate it. Um, I encourage you, if you have not already, to join our mailing of Building Health Equity. We have several, this again was our third in our series of um, Building Health Equity webinars. So feel free to join our mailing group so you can get on and know about the other ones that are coming up. Um, Expect an evaluation link um, in the chat and then also in an email. We want um, to get feedback. Again, we can't improve unless we know. So we want to hear your voice, just like we want to hear our youth voice. We want to hear your voice. If there's areas that we can improve, other things that we can um, offer for additional training and additional webinars moving forward. So please um, complete the evaluation. Again, as a reminder, this was recorded. So this will be live on the website. Um, I'm not sure when but uh, I think it goes within a day or so. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Catherine, Kathleen. Uh, Yep, ASAP, she said. So that will be on the website as soon as possible. Um, The next web webinars will be the second Wednesday of each month. Um, And the health equity practicing today's youth um, on, sorry, the, not the health equity for youth. Um, Are you, we're, the next webinar will be on rural issues in our community. So that one will be coming soon on our website. So please register for that as well. Any other additional comments, Talia or Fred? I just wanna say thank you um, for having us and whatever ways that we can stay connected, I would love to stay connected. Yep, same. Keep listening to young people, they know what's up. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll give it a few minutes to let everyone kind of add any additional comments, but 
Otherwise, thank you everyone for your participation. I appreciate it. And Fred and Talia, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day today.